Good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Mitch Hall. I'm the Chief Architect at 45 Drives. That's my colleague. Brett Kelly, Technical Director here at 45 Drives. And today we're going to be talking about harnessing the power of open source, designing a multi-tenant file system for the cloud with Ceph. Really professional sounding, I know. So today we're going to take you through the entire project, from inception all the way through the challenges we faced, all the way to now where it's in place and kind of some of the future considerations that we're uh, looking to do as things go. So to kick it off, what happened is we were approached by a Fortune 100 company to essentially look to deliver a new cloud solution for them. So they were doing media and entertainment where their plan was to have editors uh, remote into their cloud, have compute, have storage, all that in one location. And so uh, that opportunity came with a lot of really interesting constraints and interesting opportunities. Uh, and those were many. So just to look into some of the big ones, it had to be a multi-tenant solution. So storage for use in their larger cloud product, of course. Uh, needed to be storage tiered out, so they needed HDD and SSD, so a tier zero for their performance tier, and then archival. They needed to be able to start reasonably small and be able to expand on demand. Uh, I hesitate to call it a startup because of the size of the company, but in this realm, it was a new project within the larger cloud, and they needed to be able to be very elastic and be able to expand on demand as customers onboarded. Uh, they needed encryption at rest, so this was very important. Uh, they were a very security conscious company. Uh, it needed to be automated, obviously, right? We needed to be able to provision, expand, decommission tenants on demand very rapidly and very efficiently. And then finally, it needed to be a file system workflow. So multi-tenancy, file system, they aren't really inherently native to each other, so this is one of the big challenges. There was no object storage yet, but there was possibility for object in the future. So out of those constraints, five main challenges came out of that. The scalability challenge, obviously, because we had to potentially accommodate hundreds to thousands of multi-tenant workstations. Uh, the multi-tenancy challenge itself, file systems aren't inherently multi-tenant, CephFS especially. Uh, the encryption at rest challenge, so this you would think is a no-brainer simple one, but we'll get to why it was a little bit more complex. Uh, the automation challenge, so there was no code in place. We had to develop this from the ground up, and we had to find the software for it. And then finally, the file system challenge. It needed to support NFS, SMB, snapshots, quotas, all the ubiquitous things you've come to expect. So the first challenge, hardware. Uh, so for 45 drives, this one is a little bit of a second thought for us. We very tightly integrate our software, our Ceph solutions with our hardware because we are a hardware manufacturer. So it was almost like a second nature. We knew exactly kind of what we wanted. I will say we did want to start with seven storage nodes. Customer wanted five. You can see who won that battle. Um, so we also started with three compute nodes. So these were going to be the virtualized gateways for NFS, SMB. Uh, so each storage node had 30 hard drive slots, 22 SSD slots. 10 of those were reserved for Rock's DB wall for our hard drives. So obviously another company that does dense Ceph clusters. Uh, we've been doing that for a very long time. Software choices, this was also kind of a no-brainer for us. Uh, Rocky Linux is uh, massive for us, so we've been a principal sponsor of Rocky since the beginning, uh, since day one, so we love it. It's our number one OS choice for a reason. Uh, so our Ceph nodes, we're gonna be deployed on Rocky, as well as the Gateway VMs themselves. Uh, this was 2022, so at the time we were still supporting Ceph Octopus as our latest release, uh, and so that's what we went with. And then finally, Proxmox VE 7.1 was the OS. So I'm going to hand it over to Brett, and he can hop into some of the remaining challenges. Perfect. So the first thing we'll just dive right into is the segregation of the data. They were very, very worried about keeping um, customers' data away from each other. They all need to live in the same cluster, but no one could be able to inspect, get in, and, and do anything they shouldn't have been able to. Uh, so their big idea they wanted to come in was, let's have an individual pool for every one of our tenants. We said, well, you're going to have thousands of tenants. And they're just like, well, we don't want to quite have thousands of pool in one cluster. Let's have one big cluster and segregate everything using Rados namespaces. So the way we accomplished that was kind of threefold. We put three layers in. All file system data would end up living in its own Rados namespace. The CephFX key rings were all er, configured in such a way that the tenant could only access their little slice of the file system. So all the Rados data was tucked away in their area. They only had the keys to get in their part of the file system. And then that was mounted in virtual gateways, which exported then SMB or NFS to the end client, and that's all they saw. So there was a couple um, security gates, if you will. So the first one here, you can see, uh, we can control Rados namespaces, uh, where the data end up living, which, like, which directory data lived in the Rados namespace by 
just using the file, uh, Cephas file layouts. So here's a snippet of our Ansible code that when that would deploy, it would set up everything and only the customer's data would live in their particular namespace. Um, Shout out to Cephas Shell on that one. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, if, if anyone has played with changing CephX attributes in Ansible or any automated code, the whole get a key, mount it, change something, unmount it, it's horrible. CephFest shell, love it. So whoever's worked on that, I love you. Very helpful. <laughs> You're the man. Great work. Um, so then the key ring. So the, uh, here's an example of a tenant key ring, and I'll, I'll walk through the key parts of their uh, uh, permissions. So the monitor, uh, boring, need to reaccess, no big deal. Uh, on the MDS, we gave them read access to their like parent path. Um, obviously, in production, they have big long UUIDs, so no one could see who was who. I've well, just called them tenant one through whatever for illustrative purposes. But uh, yes, yeah, so we gave them read access to that only, so we didn't have any um, accidental data rights there uh, to that directory because we wanted to keep everything in either the hard drive tier or the SSD tier. So we gave them read write access. Uh, to those paths there. On the OSD side of things, we gave them read-write access to the pools in the, uh, the, yeah, the hard drive and the SSD pools in the cluster, but limited to only their individual namespaces. Uh, the last line here, the read-write execute permission on the CT2B pool, uh, when we build our SMB access into CFFS, we use CT2B for HA and for ActiveActive. Um, CT2B uses a mutex lock file to know who's master and which one's in charge. Uh, this is traditionally stored in a file system, in the shared file system. Um, we have found that Ceph, the way it dies sometimes, if, if a node goes down and it's got the lock there, it holds on to it. And it holds on to it, I think, by default for about 300 seconds. So um, luckily, CTB, the developers on that Sama side, have built a tool that allows you to put that lock file directly as an object in a Rados cluster. So we store that in the, in the cluster itself, and due to the whole namespacing of everything, we couldn't keep that in the same pool as all the data because this tool has no concept namespaces. We could have changed that, but then that's making our own version of Samba, and we just didn't want to do that at the time. So made a separate pool, and that's where all the customer's lock files live. Uh, tip, if anyone's doing this, make sure you give it the execute permission because you won't beat your head against the wall for a day trying to figure out why your cluster won't go healthy. Um, and then the third step of that, the networking, the, the kind of the iron curtain that keeps it separated. Um, all these um, gateways would, uh, the virtualized gateways, will, they would mount the CFFS file system. They were on their own individual subnet for each individual customer, and they would connect via SMB or NFS, um, thus kind of abstracting them away from CFFS, and every tenant would live on their own subnet so they couldn't go snoop around on their yeah, and individual Yeah, we disable stuff. SSH and all that just to try to lock it down as much as possible. So this one's fun. Okay, this one is funny. Encryption at rest. So not, they didn't actually need the data encrypted, but they wanted to make sure if someone to went into their data center and took some drives, that they uh, would uh, not get anything. Uh, this should be easy, right? Just use dmcrypt. It's fully supported. No, customer was, I need self-encrypting drives. I want to use them. They're, I have a hard requirement for that. So I don't know how many people have used self-encrypting drives in storage servers and stuff, but there's not always the greatest uh, tool stack for how you should do that. Um, so we had three kind of new challenges that came from that. There was no existing tools for unlocking drives and everything like that. There had to be something we had to spin, spin up for them. The open source tool we were going to use called SedUtil for unlocking and locking the drives, great, but was only supported up to 26 drives, we found. That's not going to work for a company called 45 Drives. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and then the third one, uh, unlocking drives in time before Ceph volume uh, needed them. Uh, System D you know, put that whole race in there and then <laughs> make sure everyone behaves, sometimes can be a challenge. Okay, so uh, problem number one, no existing tools for unlocking drives automatically. So we ended up doing a combination of UDEV rules and Python scripts. Uh, my initial plan was like, great, I'll have one UDEV rule that just does everything. Uh, initialize new drives just fine, like you plug a new drive in, sees that it's on, or fresh, initializes it with a lock, everything's great, but on s subsequent reboots and power cycles, the uh, it just, it was not fast enough. It was really hard to debug what was going on there. So we moved the unlocking part out of that into a uh, systemd service and parallelized it with, uh, with a Python script. Uh, challenge two with that, the said util only addressing 26 drives. Luckily, pretty easy fix here. That was a, a fork and just updated the code. They were simply just looking at SDA to Z and staying there. 
So Pretty just easy. tell them to keep looking. Um, <laughs> It, um, they were they got tired and figured they were done um, but anyway third one unlocking the drives in time before set volume wanted access to drives everything was going fine here um, except when we actually built the cluster awesome it works reboot a node OSDs don't start why drives weren't unlocked in time before set volume wanted to get them so it was a game of I never quite knew the layer of set volume turning on everything then OSD working so I got to learn how that whole stack worked and uh, so the solution for this was pretty easy, a custom override for Ceph volume service to wait for the set unlocker. Uh, another shout out, if anyone's debugging systemd tools, systemd analyze plot, really, really useful. Gives you a nice big long SVG of a time site, or uh, yeah, see what's going on. Uh, the next thing, the automation software choices. So we had to build them a set of playbooks that uh, was kind of like a single user interface to spin up, destroy, change, edit. Um, turn off access when they don't pay their bills, anything like that. Um, so we needed a set of uh, automation tools. Uh, they were not afraid of the command line. They didn't need a big UI for everything, but they wanted the kind of playbook that just said deploy, undeploy, whatever. So Proxmox was uh, the choice for virtualizing these gateways. Um, KVM plays really nicely with Ceph and uh, a lot of in-house support and uh, just Overall, great tool. Um, Ansible, very widely used uh, automation framework. We've got a lot of our existing deployment tools built with Ansible, so we were able to reuse a lot of that. Uh, Terraform, we use to uh, provision and spin up these VMs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, great tool there. And Cloudinit uh, was the last piece there. We had some complex networking stuff and SSH keys we all had to get initialized that I didn't necessarily want to do with Ansible if I didn't have to. Mm -hmm. So Cloudinit made that easy and it, uh, has native support in for Proxmox, so that was a nice bonus. Yeah, all these tools just played well, really, really nicely, so it was a great combination. Um, anyway, I'm eating a long time, so I'm gonna move on. Uh, <laughs> the SMB and NFS integration, so yeah, like I said, we with SMB, we use CDTB and Samba to uh, give HA and Active Access access into the cluster, and for uh, NFS, we use the NFS kernel server uh, on top of the CFS kernel mounts and PCS handling the VIP and NFS failover. Uh, quotas were handled through CephFS. Uh, they have them natively, no big deal there. And uh, we had to have individual kernel mounts for each directory so that they actually saw the quota we were setting. If you kind of present the parent level CephFS, you can't see everything. Let's see. And uh, yeah, snapshots. Anyway, go right. ahead, Mitch. No problem. All right, so now we had everything built, designed. Now it was time to test it. Uh, so uh, performance, but also testing the code, making sure everything's scaled properly. So we built a scaled environment. Uh, I want to be clear, this is not the end environment for the customer by uh, any stretch of the imagination, but it's what we had in the lab. So we went with four OSD nodes, 12 micron SSDs per node, three wrap, 1024 PGs. If you're interested, all the stuff's and in there. And there's SATA drives, just to be clear there, too. Yeah, SATA, SATA uh, SSDs. Uh, so the Samba Gateway VMs, we actually, this is what we tested with, but we did end up going a little beefier on the specs once we went into production. Uh, but these, these are what the tests that you're gonna see based on. Uh, as far as software configuration goes, uh, so this is another thing that we changed later on. It was a little too aggressive. Uh, we had the idea that each new tenant would deploy a new MDS, uh, but it just wasn't required. So one tenant didn't necessarily mean one client. It could have meant 10 clients under that tenant, 100, but it was typically not very high. So there was just no need for that, so we scaled that back. Uh, for the Proxmox V environment, our VM gateways were gonna be deployed on at least two nodes, so we'd never have the same gateway deployed on one physical host. And for the actual gateway environments th themselves, we use CephFS kernel mounts. We do that for a lot of reasons, mainly for the lower latency, higher performance, but also because we can get that quota to go visibility all the way to the customer, to the client, whereas VFS Samba, we don't actually get that, so. So we get to the testing. Uh, so in order to get a full test uh, picture of the environment, we needed to do a lot of testing for this. And we'll see just how many at the end uh, benchmarks we ran. But so we needed a way to spin up many clients very, very quickly. And so there's lots of great tools out there. But what we ended up doing was just adapting our playbooks that we built for this project, our Samba multi-tenancy playbooks. But instead of building client or uh, gateways, we built clients with them. So we span spun up from one all the way to 50 clients. Uh, and doing tests along the way. So we settled on six different tests. We had, uh, we used file for our benchmarking, so we had random read, write, mixed, sequential read, write, mixed, and we also did a lot of small file benchmarking as well uh, to test the MDS. Uh, so before I dive into the test, we also started with a control test of a bare metal Samba gateway uh, to 
essentially have something to compare to against our virtualized environments, and also to see where a single bare metal gateway, even with all that extra specs, where does it begin to get overwhelmed because you're passing everything through a single kernel mount and through a single Samba instance. So there's lots of really cool findings that came out of this, but I'm just gonna center on three of them. Uh, if anyone's interested in the white paper, I might be able to get it released after we scrub names and things like that. But uh, so where a single Samba gateway became overwhelmed with random IO was really interesting. Uh, virtualized gateways and how we were able to continue to scale and latency didn't just get that massive spike like we would see with bare metal. And then finally, for our latency sensitive workloads, which video editing can very much be when you're doing scrubbing and, and moving through the timeline, scaling out your gateways is very key. So let's dive into them. First one, we can see a pretty stark drop off here from 10 to 15 clients when we're doing random IO. Now this is very much worst case scenario. We're doing like eight threads of random IO per client. But we wanted to see where that drop off was. And we could see that uh, the, the bare metal not only doesn't improve, but it actually starts to get much, much worse as it becomes overwhelmed. It's a mix of the kernel mount and uh, Samba itself. So moving on to the same exact test, but doing it in a virtualized environment with five clients per gateway VM, we can see that we don't get that stark drop off in performance and it actually kind of scales. It doesn't get necessarily much faster except for in writes, but uh, at least doesn't drop off a cliff. And then finally on the uh, latency figures. So it was very, very important for us to keep latency as low as possible. Video editors don't necessarily care if we're getting 10 gigabits a second or 20 gigabits a second. They care about how does it feel when I'm scrubbing through the timeline? How does it feel when I'm doing my work? Uh, and that's what's most important. And that's why latency was so important. So what we were shooting for was to keep our latency well under 20 milliseconds. And in these tests we did, aside for the mixed workload, which was a little over 30. So, with all that out of the way, we've got our design challenges licked. They were happy with them. Mitch did his benchmarking. We were pretty confident with the solution. It was time to uh, cross the pond <laughs> over to the UK and build this thing. And that was the first time we hit a really funny snag, interesting snag. So it was a bit of a massive miscommunication between the customer and us. Uh, and this is what we expected to see when we got there. We expected to see the only place that we had micro segmentation in this entire configuration was at the tenant gateway. We expected a slash 29, which would give us an IP for each gateway and at least potentially two VIPs uh, or maybe more. But what we actually got was, and this is only a subsample of it, was everything was micro-segmented. The Ceph public network, even the Ceph backend network, uh, even the management network were all slash 30, so routing at the host, similar to kind of some of the stuff we saw earlier. And there's nothing inherently wrong with this, maybe a little higher latency what we were seeing uh, than, a, than a, the layer two network. But what the issue was is that our code did not take into account any of this. So, with Brett's Ansible skills and my networking skills over a few days at the data center. In a very we, uncomfortable <laughs> chair in the aisle of the data center. Yep, sitting on the floor sometimes. Um, we got to work. And so I'm really happy to say over a few days we were actually able to hack and slash the code to a point where we were able to deploy things. Things were working. We still had some work to do definitely when we got back home. But uh, it was in a state where the customer was very happy. We had run a successful test and everything looked good. So before I wrap up, uh, just some funny numbers that I thought I'd throw up here. So uh, we ran over 7,000 benchmarks in the lead up to this test, so that was pretty crazy. Uh, we traveled over 9,400 kilometers back and forth to get this project done. And I'm pretty sure this estimation is on the low end, but over 1,000 cups of coffee consumed. So um, with that being said, I'll let Brett wrap up with our future plans. Yeah, so when we first started doing this and they pitched what they wanted to do, the first thought in my head was, ooh, let's not virtualize, let's container this. Like, this this would be great. We want flexible spin and somb up, down, and everything. Um, at the time, though, um, the customer was a little weary of diving into containers and everything like that. They didn't want to just kind of scared them a little bit, and I was okay with that. We were comfortable in, in KVM and virtualizing that way. But uh, with all the talk we're hearing with... Uh, the support for Samba in with um, Ceph ADM and a couple weeks ago at the Samba conference um, discussing um, containerizing of this and very interested how CTDB is going to work being no, containerized because like if Kubernetes is handling, anyway, whatever. Um, really, I want to take another pass at this and, and think, of, think it through of taking the virtualization layer out, taking that Whole, like recreation of every machine and, and containerizing. Um, so that's a thought moving forward. Um, 
And a more robust solution for how we're doing multi-MDS right now. Mitch kind of touched on it where our initial plans were, oh, we're going to spin up an individual MDS for every tenant that comes in and it's going to be great. Um, we found that that wasn't really needed, mm -hmm. um, but we do need to have multiple MDSs. We need to pin people accordingly. Uh, the dynamic subtree pinning in, in the MDS was causing us some performance issues, so we we're mainly sticking things Static where we need pinning. to be. Yep. Um, when we spin up a client, we see who the least busy one is at the time and stick it there. But there is still a little bit of manualness with that, so we're, we, uh, we've got some future work there of how we'll kind of handle that cleanly. Yeah, like the code right now will at least, uh, when a new tenant comes up, it'll identify the least busy MDS. We'll kind of do some, some math there and then we'll pin it to that. But what we don't have is a good way to say when is it time to spin up a new MDS. So that's kind of a, more of a manual thing right now. So that's definitely gonna be some new stuff in the future.